I got a uh, phone call. I said, listen, I know you know Ed Pressman. He wants to take a bite at the apple. All the Capcom executives are here in town. They are taking pitches to make a feature film out of their game Street Fighter. Are you familiar with it? I said, familiar with it. My kids have put like a fortune in quarters in those machines. You know, I'm very familiar with it. So I went in and I pitched a plot that was influenced by movies that I liked when I was a kid. It was not going to be a tournament that everybody was coming together for. I had to invent something else for everybody to be coming together for. And recently we had had Saddam Hussein in the first Gulf War. So I said, okay, it's a Saddam Hussein, you know, Bison is like Saddam Hussein. He's taken hostages from all over the world, which brings people from all over the world. And, you know, and you follow through. It was going to be like the Guns of Navarone, which I named in the meaning of an action adventure movie with, you know, lots of locations, bigger scale and uh, bigger stakes than uh, winning the tournament. And in fact, like three days later, they said, okay, you're our guy. We're making this movie with Ed Preston. This was a big step for Capcom. They completely, they financed this movie completely themselves, which meant that all of the profit would be theirs, except for a distribution fee that the studio would get. All the profit would be there, all the risk was theirs as well. To cover their risk and to signal to the worldwide audience, this is a big picture. They wanted a big, big star for Guile, who was gonna be the, the most prominent character among the good guys, and for Bison. So right away they wanted to get like Stallone or Schwarzenegger or Harrison Ford and they said those are beyond your budget. I mean the budget for the movie, they wanted to make the movie for, at that time they were thinking uh, in the mid 20s. It ended up going up to I think uh, about 32 million, a million all in by the end of the day because of the rush schedule. After they said oh we can't afford Harrison Ford, they said how about Jean-Claude Van Damme? So he said well if he's playing, you know, an American officer, there is that accent problem. And then the Capcom people said, what accent? And then of course I realized that John Claude, like most American stars or international stars, is dubbed. So this, this argument was just lost on them. They got fixated on John Claude as the biggest name they could afford. And so when that became inevitable, I said, all right, then we'll just say he's from Louisiana. In fact, we did in the movie have dialogue that he was from Louisiana. But as you tighten the movie up and trying to get it to be moving faster and faster, it's one of the things, somehow the dialogue about him being Louisiana fell out of the movie. You're all under arrest. They said, we want a big name for a bison as well. Our number one choice before they said, we want bison to be a huge international name was Stephen Lang who was just phenomenal. He came in and read for us. And if, if they had not like, you know, pressed and pressed and pressed to get a big name, it would have been Stephen Lang, who of course has had this distinguished career since then, you know, whether it was in Tombstone or uh, in Avatar, he's the big bad in Avatar. So Raul Julia, everybody loved the idea of Raul Julia. It was just, and we were just thrilled to get a, an actor of that caliber. It turned out that as Raul has told many times in interviews, his kids played the game. You know, every week or so scripts come over the desk and the kids see, a script Street Fighter, they lost their minds. You shall be killed by a wild beast. A beast born of my own genius. With these two guys, John Claude got his biggest paycheck ever at that point, $7 million. And I think Raul was, I think around three, I'm not sure. So we had $10 million just on those two actors. Like, do the math, you gotta build sets. You gotta fly people to like Thailand and Australia, which was what the plan was. So the decision now came down to, for the rest of the cast, do we get martial artists and hope they can act? Or do we get actors and teach them the martial arts? Because the fighting moves in the game have like zero connection to real martial arts, we ended up leaning towards actors. So the idea was we were going to go to Thailand to get some location work and then shoot the rest of the picture on sound stages in Australia, which is closer to Thailand and the exchange rate was better. So, so that was the plan. Now then, 
Where are those hostages? And that means that if we're shooting the principal stuff, the dialogue scenes, all of, Ra all of Raul's material, all of his material, that's almost a month of training the rest of the cast in these special wacky Street Fighter martial arts moves, which have no bearing on reality, which ended up backfiring on us when Raul turned out to be, have just come out of the hospital, just had surgery, and was recuperating. <laughs> I don't think so. So when he came to Australia for uh, costume fitting, I get a phone call from Marilyn Vance. She was actually arrived in Australia ahead of me, and she called me up and said, we have a problem. Raul, he's been sick or something. He, he looks like a skeleton. He's, I'm going to have to put padding in the uniform. The costume I, I, I measured him for in the States like five months ago, it's like for another person. This created a last minute scramble of the shooting schedule. I needed to push all of Raul's work as far back in the shooting schedule as possible. We had a 10 week shooting schedule. And now, Miss Zhang, you will witness firsthand the power that you spurned. Two months before we started the movie, I went to Thailand to pick, look at the studio and to approve lo locations. Remember that wonderful location for UN, pardon me, Allied Headquarters? That used to be the Coast Guard station for Thailand, but they built a new headquarters. It's a wonderful building. And there's this giant hangar that was for all the Coast Guard boats. And we're going to put a floor in there where the boats used to pull in. And it's gigantic. It's like an airplane hangar. That'll be your soundstage. You build the sets in there. I go, all right, okay. So we go over to Thailand. And the first thing that happens is all of the electrical equipment is kind of wonky and it's the rainy season and it gets wet. And even if it rains just briefly in the morning, the lights don't go on. So we're losing hours and hours every day because the equipment is not turning on. Things are shorting out. It's one thing after another. Then we go to film inside the supposedly wonderful hangar. It had a metal roof, a corrugated metal roof. So when it rained or drizzled, which was constantly, you'd hear the noise, the pitter patter of rain and we could not get rid of it. On top of that, this building was so decrepit that there were so many holes in the wall that every scene you would film in there, it was like a John Woo movie where light is coming in the bullet holes. So we're looking at dailies and more and more of our, our material is unusable. And finally, the last straw was when we did the scene where John Claude is briefing the troops about the stealth, how we're going to attack Bison's headquarters, and he shows slides of the headquarters and there's like graphic of the boat. We filmed that scene, it was completely unusable. There was so much ambient light coming in that you couldn't even see the projection he's up on the screen. So finally the decision was made, you know what, we're throwing the towel in on Thailand and we're going to Australia. And now we're gonna have to reshoot Half the material we shot in Thailand is going to have to be reshot in Australia. We have nine days of material we're throwing out. So we're going to add nine days to the schedule in Australia, right? Uh, no, we can't. If we add nine days to the schedule in Australia, the movie won't be out Christmas Day. So now the pace of production in Australia had to be cranked up to a crazy degree. Popular guy, the greatest cage fighter since Iron Fist. Oh yeah, what happened to him? He retired and became me. There were a number of things that like were extremely frustrating or required last minute scrambling, obviously pulling out of Thailand early because uh, the, the locations we were given to film for interiors were useless was one. Another last minute wrinkle, if you look at the pre-production art, you'll see the original attack of the United Nations, sorry, Allied Nations force on Bison's headquarters in the pre-production art is a helicopter attack. But while we were in Thailand, while we were filming, there was some political chaos, demonstrations against the, uh, the royal family. And in fact, in some portions of Thailand, there was martial law was declared. And they came back to us and they said, we are concerned that if we let you film this helicopter sequence, it is gonna cause panic and rumors that like things are completely out of control 
that a whole squadron of helicopters is flying over the city and so forth and flying over the area. So we don't want to do that. You can't do the helicopter thing. An attack from the air is impossible. The only chance is an assault with a small amphibious force here. The main force will come from the north, while a single vessel equipped with the latest in stealth technology will come up this channel and distract its defenses from the east. So that's why at the last minute it became a, an assault, an amphibious assault, and that's why at the last minute the design of a stealth boat that was originally in the movie for Bison to try and escape the aerial assault from his secret base. He had a hidden uh, exit and that we repurposed that stealth boat which had been designed for Bison to an attempt to escape in. And we said, all right, that's the special boat that Colonel Guile does to lead the assault. And all of the other boats that we got for the assault were actually uh, Thai Coast Guard vessels. Attention all boats, stand by at attack Vector Alpha. I'll take out the enemy radar. Captain Sawada, I'm counting on you. We'll be there, Colonel. Just save some for us. Uh, working with Ralph Julia was one of the high points of my entire career, and uh, I uh, cherished the time I spent with him. And although I was shocked by his appearance the first day I saw him, the amazing thing uh, about him was his energy level was 110% the entire time. He showed if he was feeling weak or he was flagging, he, I never saw a sign of it. Now, granted, I only spent, he only worked one day when he was at his like uh, most gaunt thinnest and we put him on a health regimen. I mean, we were like special food and training and they, they were like getting him ready for the Olympics. But his stamina was just incredible. And you, you can see the, the levels performance even in that first scene with Dolphin, I mean, the the level of energy he gets there, that was at that was at his at his lowest point. My science twisted to serve perversion instead of peace. Tell you what, after I've crushed my enemies, we'll see about getting you published. That should cheer you up. Hmm? You know, he studied for this role. He looked at newsreels of Mussolini. If you look at newsreels of Mussolini, you can see that he is copying Mussolini's body language. He like totally embraced the part, which is what's so wonderful about the performance. He totally believes everything he says. That's the great thing. Like he totally is engaged and believes that character. And of course, no one thinks they're the villain of their own story, which he said to me. You know, he thinks he's a hero. All I want to do is to create the perfect genetic soldier, not for power, not for evil, but for good. And after we finished the entire movie and wrapped the movie, he said to Capcom, we got these amp these fights up. So we went up to Canada and we rebuilt the set, the big fight at the end of the movie between Ken and Ryu and Sagat and uh, Vega. That was filmed after the picture was principal photography had done. That was a pickup scene that we did in Vancouver. This is where a lot of the material for Captain Sawada came in, the famous sequence that we do a parody of Godzilla that was shot up there. The end of the picture, I think, delivers on two kick-ass fights intercut with each other. You still refuse to accept my godhood. Keep your own god. In fact, this might be a good time to pray to him. When Capcom zeroed in on Jean-Claude Van Damme as a star that they recognized in Japan who was, you know, meant something, it would signal it's a big, big movie, I said to them at that point, you understand that unlike these other actors we are talking about, his work has been almost exclusively hard R rated movies with a lot of violence. And you may be setting yourself up for a, a, a reaction to the film of disappointment from John claude Van Damme fans. And they were totally blew off that concern. They had no problem with it. This is the collection agency, Bison. Your ass is six months overdue. And it's mine. Kyle? So I was not surprised to see, to hear complaints 
that where it was you know it was soft, John Claude didn't kick ass, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. That was uh, not a surprise, and I wasn't entirely surprised by the critics bashing it because this was still a time when, if you were coming out of video games, they had their knives out. Then defeat is a possibility. Very well. We shall face it together, DJ. With the stoicism of the true warrior. Battle systems are compromised. So I think I think Street Fighter got like one good review, like in, in one major publication. But the strangest thing that I got from a lot of people was this movie is so stupid and so misguided. It's funny. In years to come, people will laugh at this because it's so dumb. And I don't know how anyone could look at this movie and think it's not supposed to be funny. And only now, in recent years, just by the way, on the 25th anniversary of this movie, there were all these like articles all over you know, all the websites about looking at Street Fighter, hey, this movie's pretty good. Oh my God, it was supposed to be funny. Oh my God, it is a parody. So, you know, it, it, you know, it, it only took 25 years, but I'm glad I finally saw some good reviews.